Deep in the heart of the bayou, players may come across this isolated cabin, hidden away in the swamps, Bayol Edge. Inside, the room is littered with paintings and scribblings, and the walls are pasted with newspaper clippings. One painting, a little more than a blur, lays as the centerpiece. Nothing but a few candles and a couple of oil lanterns provide light to this otherwise dimly lit room. There's something unnerving about the feel to this place. Welcome to the video, you're listening to Phil of Philby Gaming, and today we're exploring the tale of one of the most unexplained characters in the universe of Red Dead Redemption, The Strange Man. We'll look at uncovering some details, the man's influences, and potential references with the aim of trying to piece together the story behind this peculiar individual. This video is theory only, which I've drawn from speculation. Please be aware, there will be major spoilers ahead for both the first and second game of the Red Dead Redemption series. If you enjoyed today's video, you all know what to do. Now let's begin with what we came here to see. I knew a man, once. A look at the mysterious stranger. Upon entering the home at Bayall Edge, the painting in the centre is in our immediate line of sight, with an easel to its left. It's unclear, at first, what the art is trying to portray, as it's just a mix of colouring with a figure of some sorts in the centre. Around the shack, we can see multiple other paintings of such things as landscapes, books and eagles, all surrounded by candlelight. For those who choose to play their game at a more dishonourable level, they may experience other images instead, such as vultures, coyotes and wolves. On a table, carved into the top, there's a poem which reads, There once was a man called Jimmy Brooks, who was always running into crooks, but the man from the ferry found him too contrary, now Jimmy's family don't see him very much. The etching is referring to Arthur Morgan and his encounter with the man from Blackwater, whom we meet at the beginning of Chapter 2, during the Polite Society Valentine-style mission, in which Arthur is given a choice to either spare the man or kill him. As you can tell, during my current playthrough, Arthur chose to end the life of Jimmy, but for those who spared the man, when visiting this home, the scribblings will read differently and it will go as follows. There was a man called Jimmy Brooks, who was always running into crooks, till one chased him down and he had talked his way around, that Jimmy isn't as dumb as he looks. Whoever made this inscription appears to have been keeping a close eye on Arthur Morgan, or maybe the entire Vandalin gang themselves. Furniture resides to the left of the room, and next to that is a second table, Sat atop this table, closest to the centre painting, is a plan of the town of Armadillo, with the following handwritten on the paper. I offered you happiness for two generations. You made your choice. We'll discuss the meaning behind this later in the video. In the corner of the room, on the rack next to the mirror, is a black top hat that may seem a little familiar to some. Upon the walls are several scribblings. From the snow to the grave, I gave everything for art and learned too much and nothing at all. The water is black with venom. His final toll will sound my greatest coming. The moon will shine on in the darkness. And finally, I know you. We'll decipher each of these scribblings further in the video. Back outside, if players are to take a photograph of the cabin, it will strangely be labelled as Serial Killer, but this is not the home of Edmund Lowry. Not much more can be found at Bayer Ledge for now, until you wait a few in-game days and then return to the home. Upon doing so, you will notice that the picture in the centre of the room is altered and has become more clear. We can now see the form of a gentleman, who is wearing a top hat, same as the one hanging nearby. This shows that the artist still resides here, 
and has been updating his work. As a little experiment, back outside, I destroyed the hanging bottles and the lantern to see if they would be replaced upon a third visit. A few in-game days later, as I arrived once more, these items had in fact been replaced, proving that the shack was definitely still inhabited. Plus, the painting in the center of the room was now showing a much clearer image. The fourth and final visit to Bay All Edge was by far the spookiest encounter. The picture was now in its full form, showing us the very recognizable character from the original Red Dead Redemption title, who players know only as the Strange Man, a peculiar character that John Marston can meet who seems to know a great deal about his past and his time with the Vandalin Gang. Hello, John. John Marston. Do I know you? I hope so. I seem to know you. But did you notice something as we entered the property? In the mirror next to the now empty hat rack, we can see that John is being watched by the strange man himself. If we try to turn to face the man, he disappears just as quickly as he appeared. John can now finally inspect the painting, which is noted simply as painting in cabin. He writes the following in his journal. This place makes me feel like I was being watched. Queerest feeling I ever felt. Hard to explain. Fascinating and awful and seductive all at once. I couldn't find anything else to take note of at Bay All Edge, so it was time to look into some of the clues we had found so far. Firstly, the plan of the town of Armadillo upon the table seemed intriguing, so I felt a visit was in order. The town of Armadillo is suffering from a cholera pandemic. Many of the local inhabitants have fled due to this, and that mostly it's only the sick and the dead that populate the area. As soon as I entered, I was met with a town crier, ringing his bell, warning any travellers to leave the area immediately, in fear for their safety. Mister? Hey partner, I'd stay out of town if you can. Place is full of cholera. So many dead they can't even bury him properly. Uh, thank you. Fires burn through both the centre of town and the outskirts disposing of the victims of the plague. Most of the town's businesses have been closed, such as the gunsmith, the bank and the freight station, although a few remain active. The undertaker, the saloon, although it's not saving food or taking lodgings, and the general store. This general store, owned and operated by one Herbert Moon, seems untouched by the surrounding pandemic. Upon entering his store, John notices something behind the counter that he questions the clerk about. Who's that? Uh, I don't know. It's just a little portrait somebody gave me once. I always quite liked it. Why? No reason. Just seemed familiar. The picture is of the strange man, with Herbert Moon stating he kept it because he simply liked it. But is there something more to this? Not far from the town itself, I came across a camper who had a little insight into Armadillo. He had the following to say. So, not sure you passed through Armadillo at all. Whew. Place like hell on earth these days. Used to be quite a nice little town too. Now it's just dust storms and disease and death. They take in the burning bodies because they can't bury them fast enough. I mean, when you see it, it really feels like something biblical. <laughs> and I ain't a religious man. Uh... Really, it's a sight to behold. I certainly ain't never read the Bible on account of me not reading and all, but for a place to turn like that, so bad and so fast, you can't help but thinking, this can't be of natural causes. Folk there are calling it a curse. And I ain't a superstitious man but it's hard not to see it any other way. They are saying this figure appears sometimes there in the distance. Black suit and big top hat, then disappears. Shadowy. 
like he ain't of this mortal realm. Yep. <laughs> Reaper and his Sunday best. Maybe they're being punished uh, for sins or something, I don't know. I got enough sins on my tally to figure I'm gonna stay well away from there. And I ain't a betting man, but I put my money on this. Way things are, won't be long before Tumbleweed is the only town left in these parts, and there won't be nothing in Armadillo but ghosts. The camper is referring to the strange man, describing his black suit and big top hat, the Reaper in his Sunday best. But for what reason could the strange man have for placing the apparent curse on this town? The store owner, Herbert Moon, may have the answers. For anyone who's played the original Red Dead Redemption, including the infamous Undead Nightmare DLC, they may be aware of Herbert's prejudicial ways. Hey mister. Hey Pard. You seen a couple deputies nearby? Marshall's boys. Jonah and Eli. Are they Jews, mister? They sound like Jews. I don't know. Why? Why? <laughs> this whole thing is nothing but a Jewish plot. You do know that, don't you? But how does this relate to the strange man and the plague which has gripped this town? If John is to search the body of Herbert, he will find a letter, which I'll leave on screen for a moment for those wishing to both pause and read. There were some very interesting things to take note of in this letter. We learn that Herbert Moon disowned his own daughter, whom was pregnant at the time of the writing of this letter, simply because she fell in love with and betrothed a man who was not the same race as her, and that he believed that the selling of groceries was both the purest and best calling one could have. He truly loved this store. But again, how does this tie in with the strange man and the apparent curse on the town of Armadillo? To answer that, we must return to Bayall Edge and recall the map of Armadillo and its writings. I offered you happiness or two generations. You made your choice. Herbert Moon chose two generations over being happy, of course referring to his daughter and grandchild. Choosing not to be happy resulted in two separate situations for the store owner. Although he still had both a daughter and a grandchild, he couldn't see past his own racially motivated thoughts and forced himself to cut ties with his offspring. Secondly, although he himself is about the only person in the town not physically affected by the cholera outbreak, his business has surely suffered, with most of the populace fleeing and the remaining slowly passing away. Herbert Moon seems to have made a deal with the strange man, causing the pandemic upon the town of Armadillo. Let's take a look back at each of the writings upon the walls of Bayall Edge and piece together what they mean. From the snow to the grave, this is referring to the Vandalin gang's travels, showing that the strange man had been following them during their time in the snow-covered mountains, to the final chapter of Arthur's playthrough at Beaver Hollow. The water is black with venom. When we are first introduced to the gang, they are escaping the ferry heist in the town of Blackwater. This is the first story mission of the game. In the final mission of the game, where John kills Micah Bell, it's titled American Venom. Micah was the one who convinced Dutch to perform the ferry job. This references the fall of the gang from start to finish all due to the actions of Micah Bell. His final toll will sound like Greater's coming. Armadillo has suffered over the years. Shortly before cholera, it was scarlet fever. As we see in the events of the first Red Dead Redemption during 1911, the town is back in business. The town crier, whom we meet in 1907, rings his bell, signaling that the strange man has completed his work. I gave everything for art and I learned too much and nothing at all. The paintings in Bayall Edge differentiate depending on the players on the level. The strange man has been telling the story of your actions through his art. 
the moon will shine on in the darkness. Herbert Moon is the only one in the entire town not affected by the cholera pandemic. He was the one to sell his soul, affecting everybody around him. And finally, I know you. This is the name of the three-part mission strand in Red Dead Redemption, where John Marston encounters the strange man. We've covered the events from 1899 to 1907, so let's move forward to 1911. John first meets the strange man in Hennigan'stead and has the following interaction. Hello, John. John Marston. Do I know you? I hope so. I seem to know you. I'm pretty good at remembering faces. Are you? Do you remember Hattie McCourt's face? Who? She was a girl Dutch Vanderlyn shot in the head on that raid on the ferry a few years back. Same one you got shot on. Pretty girl, until her eye was hanging out by a thread of tendon and her brain was plastered over a wall. Not really. Then why would you remember me, friend? You've forgotten far more important people than me. What's your game, friend? I don't have a game, John. Listen, sometimes I just wish I'd known more about life. Wish I'd had better guidance. A friend of mine is drunk as a skunk in the saloon on Thieves' Landing. I think he's gonna be unfaithful to his dear wife. Why don't you head over there and see if you can advise him how best to proceed. What do you think I am? I know what you are, John. Just if you've got the time, friend. The man is very mysterious, but he knows a lot about John and his past, even the specific details surrounding Hady McCourt. He asks John for assistance, giving a moral choice. This will affect his honor rating, which we now understand that he was recording for his artwork. John later meets the strange man once more, this time in Nuevo Pariso, Mexico. Depending on the player's previous choice, this scene will somewhat differentiate. Welcome to Nuevo Pariso, John. Where do I know you from? You're famous, John. You're the man who shot a bunch of banditos as soon as he turned up in this country. You're a man who decided right and wrong between a man and death, between a man and his wife. And who are you? You know, I admire you, John. I hope my boy turns out just like you. For your sake, I hope he don't. You kill people so easily, yet you respect the vows of marriage. That's very curious. I'll let the appropriate authorities judge my morality, friend. Yes, you will. And they shall. Anyway, I hear that an old nun is traveling from the monastery, taking the money she raised at the bank. Why don't you head up there and see if you can lend her a hand? The road's full of thieves. Either that or rob her yourself. I'll see you around, John. I hope you don't. The strange man knows about John's violent encounter with the bandits as he first entered Mexico. Also, he claims to admire John and hopes his boy turns out just like him. The player is once again given a choice to make, but this time there's something more interesting than a drunkard being unfaithful. The nun outside Las Hermanas, who's collecting for the poor, is Mother Superior Calderon. During Chapter 4 of Red Dead Redemption 2, when playing as Arthur Morgan, this same character can be encountered and acts as a moral compass for Arthur. The third and final encounter is on the land of Beecher's Hope, the home of the Marston family. I'll play the clip first and then point out some very interesting things that we need to take note of. Hey, there's a beautiful spot. Sure. What are you doing here? My accounts. I'm an accountant. Is that so? In a way. 
What's your name? You know, it's the darndest thing. I can't remember. Tell me your damn name and where you know me from. Well, I know you're from Mexico. I know you're from back out west. Well, I know you from all over. Tell me your name or I won't be responsible for my actions. Oh, but you will. You will be responsible. This is a fine spot. See you around, cowboy. Damn you! Yes, many have. The strange man claims he can't remember his name, but that he's an accountant, in a way. Sometimes, agents of higher beings, such as the Grim Reaper for the Lord, or demons for the Devil, are often referred to as accountants, as they keep track of people. This would explain both the paintings and writings at Bay Edge. John states his final words to the man, damning him, to which he simply replies, many have, referencing that he is, in fact, damned. To be damned is to be condemned by God to suffer eternal punishment in hell. John fires three rounds directly at the man, all to no avail. He stops before firing the fourth. The location where this takes place is the same spot where in the epilogue of the first title, John, Abigail and Uncle are all laid to rest. Before we get in to the final thoughts of the video, I want to personally thank 186 Canario, who informed me of the upcoming piece of information. In German folklore, there's a demon known as Mephistopheles. Legend tells that an ambitious scholar known as Johann George Faust made a deal with the devil at the price of his soul, with Mephistopheles acting as the devil's agent. In our western tale, the strange man is Mephistopheles, and the armadillo store owner, Herbert Moon, is Johann George Faust. This is known as the Faust legend. I don't want to get too off topic with the video, so I'll leave a link to a webpage where you can find more information on this legend if you wish to do so. This adds to the theory that the strange man is working for the devil, or is potentially the devil himself. As an opposite thought, others believe that he is a god, or an angel sent from above to guide John, thus giving him the moral choices. When John tells him he'll let the appropriate authorities judge his morality, the strange man informs him that they will. Referring back to Mother Superior Calderon, during the conversation with Arthur in saint -Denis, she reveals that she had a somewhat seedy past, but then she found love. She may have encountered the strange man at some point herself, who guided her to a much purer life, and sent John to her as a test to his character. The most popular theory is that the strange man is the Grim Reaper, who is a spectral entity that is believed to be the manifestation of death. It is not the Reaper's duty to kill any mortals, but simply shadow them before their untimely death. This could explain why, in John's final encounter, he is standing at his future gravesite. Some believe that he may be an ancestor of John. This is heavily influenced during their meeting in Nuevo Pariso, where he says he admires John and that he hopes his son turns out just like him. Before John meets the strange man in Hennigan'stead, the player must complete a mission at McFarlane's ranch titled A Tempest Looms. A tempest is a heavy storm, usually rain and wind. Some may refer to this by stating that the heavens have opened. A tempest is referred to in the Bible during the 40 days of rain and the great flood of Noah. The Lord may have created the tempest to allow the strange man a more physical passage into the world from the heavens. Although, I'll admit, this may be grasping at straws a little. Referring back to the camper we met just outside of Armadillo, he states that he believes in the near future, the town of Tumbleweed will be the only one in the region left standing, 
and that armadillo will crumble and be nothing more than a ghost town. Just a few years later, in 1911, the two towns have seemingly switched places, with armadillo thriving and tumbleweed now abandoned. It may be that the strange man had finished what he needed to do in Armadillo with Herbert Moon and had moved on to his next. As for the final encounter, with the three rounds having no effect, this could be that the strange man had completed his work as the accountant on the gang. The three shots fired may represent the deaths of John, Abigail and Uncle. John was given one final opportunity to become a better man, but allowed his anger to get the better of him, losing control and firing away. This was his final test, and failing it caused the inevitable demise of his family, thankfully stopping before firing the last round, which would have been for Jack, allowing his son to continue on with his life, later becoming a good man not following the ways of an outlaw. Nobody seems to have the correct answer to the identity of the strange man, and I believe this was intentional by Rockstar, so that we, as the players, could conclude our own theories. Do you have any theories not covered today as to the identity and meaning behind the man? Let me know in the comments section below. If you enjoyed today's video, be sure to hit like, subscribe, turn on notifications and share with friends and family or anyone you may feel would enjoy content such as this. Thank you all for watching, you've been listening to Phil and I'll see you in the next one.